All right. Everybody here with me? Down in the back. Sorry about the delay. <laughs> uh, I had the trouble with the projector, of course, usually have. So I'm going to talk a bit about church encoding and concatenative programming languages. Um, and I thought I would start out with just telling a short story about why I love concatenative programming so much. And it started out uh, way back when I was a student. And I took this uh, AI course. Uh, and I had the, the great inspired idea of trying to learn functional programming, Lisp, Dvorak, and Vim at the same time doing the assignments. <laughs> so <laughs> that worked out about as well as you can think. <laughs> I didn't learn Vim, didn't learn Dvorak. I only got the rudimentary uh, introduction to Lisp, but still, uh, I stuck with this uh, nice idea of, um, of getting in a sort of a feeling about how functional programming could be a wonderful thing. I sat down and I thought, oh, how great. We have um, these simple constructs. You have this simple core with uh, small functions, and you sort of build on top of that. The simplicity and the craft that was, went away, it was sort of a great revelation. And I was happy for a while. But then I got quite sad as well because I thought there can't be anything else in this world that's so simple and beautiful as functional programming. And I was sad for many years, thought I would never experience the revelation of learning about something as functional programming again. But then I learned about uh, concatenative programming and I sort of discovered that it had the same basic building blocks uh, or similar building blocks, but the same simplicity or beauty as I have found in functional programming. So what I want to give you is sort of a quick introduction to concatenative programming, and I hope you will leave with at least some idea, vague idea of the beauty that lies within. All right, a quick overlook on the agenda. So I'm going to talk first about concatenative programming. What is it in a sort of abstract general way? Then we're going to look at uh, an example of a functional uh, a concatenative programming language called Stick. And then we're going to do some church encoding, sort of to get to know how you can do concatenative programming in Stick. All right. Concatenative programming, programming, what is it? So I'd like to start with the syntax when talking about concatenative programming. So um, I've made a couple of tables up here that sort of describes regular functional statements where you have functions in a sort of familiar uh, syntax. And then on the right side, we have a corresponding concatenative syntax. So the first table just shows some functions, not applied to anything. And I think the third line is the one that's the most interesting. So you have a composition of the function f and the function g. And instead of writing something inside of something other, you just write f and then g. So I like to think of concatenative programming of being uh, programming languages where you trade application for functional composition. So the basic unit that you use when you write programs is composition. You compose together functions by writing them side by side. Uh, another interesting thing about the first table is that you see uh, there's not really a difference between f and f prime, although one takes one argument and the other one takes two arguments. That's just because you usually don't declare anything about the amount of values some function is going to take. So the second table sort of shows what happens when you apply functions to values. So here you have uh, the function f applied to tree, and then you would just write tree and then f. And the same thing goes for two arguments, so five and three and f prime. And then the interesting things start to happen because um, in the second line we have f tree, no, no, we have five tree f prime. So that's f prime applied to two values. But the line below it, we have uh, the composition of f and g applied to tree. And it's the same syntax. Uh, it's not two different things. So this can be quite puzzling. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. But if you sort of think of uh, numbers as just function that returns some value and takes no values, you can sort of see that we're still talking about functional compositions, although it looks sort of like we're doing two things with one syntax. All right, let's talk about how concatenative programs can be executed. So I made this homemade formalism to talk about concatenative program execution. I guess there is a proper formalism out there in the mathematical landscape somewhere. I'm just a bit too lazy to read all the papers, and this would probably be a much longer talk if I should do this properly. 
So I have sort of made this uh, syntax where I use the arrow operator as something I call simplify to. And then I will write sort of a, a program execution state, being lots of concatenated functions. And then I say, all right, this expression, this can be simplified to this other expression. And you see here we have a mathematical expression, 2, 3 added, and then 1, 1 added, and then multiplied. This looks a lot like a postfix calculator for those of you that have tried one out before. And then we can start. All right, can we simplify something in the first expression? Yeah, we can simplify 1, 1 plus, because 1 plus 1 is 2. All right, let's re replace 1, 1 plus with 2. And then we do the same thi thing again. Is there something now that we can simplify? Yeah, we can simplify 2, 3 plus, and that becomes 5. And finally, we have enough values to simplify the multiplication, and we get 10. And now we can do no further simplification, so execution is done. As you can see, simplification is sort of not a well-defined term. Uh, I hope to be revisiting that at some point. But enough about uh, abstract stuff. Let's go concrete and talk about a specific concatenative programming language. And of course, I would love to talk about my own concatenative programming language called Stick. It's called Stick. It's spelled without an I, because naming stuff without vocals is cool. And also, it's uh, all caps letters, so I like to think of this as this other language with no pronounceable acronym, also known as Stick. All right, so what is Stick? Stick is a stack-based concatenative programming language. So at this point, we haven't talked about stacks, but usually when you sort of get to know some concatenative programming languages, you start out by talking about the stack. But the stack is not central to a language being concatenative. It could be implemented with other data mechanisms. Um, Stick is a stack-based concatenative program language. That just means that the execution state is kept on a stack. So when we did the simplifications earlier, execution state can be kept on a stack. And you can sort of envision all states of being some kind of stack with some kind of values on top. Um, then you have simplification. In our previous example, we did simplification in the middle of the expression, because there's not really, uh, you can simplify everywhere. But in stick, simplification is implemented so it's strictly done from left to right. So there's no m magic simplification going on earlier in the program and then just coming together at the end. If you want to write programs, you have to make it so that all simplifications can happen strictly from left to right. And then we have maybe the most interesting feature. This is quite uh, this is a quite strict uh, concatenative programming language. And it means that it's created um, mostly to illustrate a more purely concatenative programming, if that's the correct term. You have a lot of uh, stack-based programming languages that have concatenative parts in it, but they also rely heavily on stuff that's not concatenative. And this is not perfect by all means, but it, it's maybe a good way to show what's the concatenative and what's the stack part. All right. Let's see how this works in practice. So we have very basic stuff like symbols. So I can just write A, and I can write B, and then I'll get the stack with A and B on. And since um, A was written first, this it will be pushed to the bottom of the stack, and then I got B, and then I got B at the top of the stack. Symbols can be several words, like uh, hello is a word made of several characters. Um, and then I can do stuff with the symbols that's already on the stack. I can reorder them. I can remove symbols. So I can remove hello. I can swap stuff around. I can duplicate stuff. I can duplicate it several times if I want. And then I can do sort of some more advanced manipulations on the stack. And the first one you usually stumble upon is rotate, root. So when I rotate, I access the three topmost elements on the stack. And what happens is that I push the two topmost elements on the stack one step down, and I take the third topmost element and put it back on top. So you see how B and C got pushed one level down, and A got picked up and put on the top again? If I rotate once more, B is on the top, A and C was put down. If I rotate one more again, I'll get the same thing as I started with. And in stick, there's no operators that work on more than the topmost three elements. 
And actually, if you look at a lot of, a lot of other stack-based programming languages, you don't really use any operators that work on more than the topmost three elements. So it sort of always works out. I'm not sure why. But I propose that uh, this can be made into a conjecture. All stack-based programming languages only need to access the three topmost elements. So if you find a proof, proof please tell me. All right. So then we have some more. Uh, that we have something else than symbols as well. We have something called quotations. And quotations is something you use to delay execution. So um, let's say I have something like A, B, and then I want to remove something. If I just um, have this program, then the drop, the dot, is going to be executed as soon as the program reaches it. It's going to throw away the B. So simplifying this will be A. The simplification happens immediately. But let's say I wanted to keep the expression A, B, and dot, and I don't want it to be simplified just yet. Well, then I can wrap it in brackets, and this is called a quotation. So like this, and now I have a bracket thingy, quotation. I like to call them anonymous stacks, because they're sort of the anonymous function of concatenative programs. And uh, a quotation works as a symbol as well. So if I have another symbol, I can swap it around with a quotation. And you sort of, um, you wouldn't know it's something that can be made into something else before you try to do specialized things with it. And one of the things we can do with a quotation is that we can apply it. And applying it just meaning take the thing inside the quotation and apply it to the main stack. So. I get something like this. It took a b dot and it applied it and then simplified the b dot. And this is sort of like applying a function. So you make an applied function by combining a quotation and an application. And the nice thing about having stuff like quotation is that we can make uh, language constructs that need to know something about this is some program I want to run at some specific time. So if I want to make a name function, for instance, I would like to have a name. Names are, of course, going to be symbols here. And then I want some expression that tells me that this name is going to be bound to this kind of action. So we can do stuff like this, hi. And then we can call this hello. All right, now I have a symbol and quotation. And then I can define the word using a hashtag symbol. All right. Everything went away. The hashtag symbol took all our quotation and symbols away, and now we got something that works like this. All right, hello. Another nice thing about this is that um, we can't actually redefine hello now. So there's some immutability built into this kind of syntax. So say I want to do something like this. OK, B. I want to uh, rebind hello to B. Oh, this won't work, because I can never put the symbol hello on the stack again because of the eager simplification. All right. We can do stuff with quotation as well. Let's say we have a quotation like this. And we want to chop off the first element of the quotation. And we can use a chop operator. It gives us something like this. And we can combine quotations by using concat symbol. And this gives us the ability to manipulate quotations and, in essence, manipulate programs before they are executed. So we can build up new programs, combining quotation, and then we, when we have a final program, we can apply it to get that desired effect on top of uh, executed. All right. So let's talk about church encoding. So I guess a lot of you have uh, done church encoding and learned about it. For those of you that I haven't heard about church encoding before. This is just a way to represent data with functions. So you, you sort of say you make these kinds of functions, and you say that this function, this is going to represent the, the Boolean false, and this function is going to represent the Boolean true. And by doing this in clever ways, you get uh, interesting data meaning like functions that you can do stuff with. And as far as um, this talk has gone, we haven't seen Booleans and numbers yet, so we'll try to make them now. All right, so this is uh, a usual way of uh, church encoding Booleans. So you make a function that takes two arguments, 
and it gives you one back. And then you have true, it will give you the first argument, because it sort of chooses the first argument, and then false will give you the other argument. And I like this idea because it sort of, um, it encompasses the idea that Booleans are tied to making a choice. So how can we make this in a concatenative language? Well, we would like something um, that's just represented with true and false, because as we saw in the syntax part of the talk, uh, we don't really declare the stuff that the function is going to take. And then we would like something that's not applied immediately, like a quotation. Because if we just had a, b, true would give us uh, a, then we wouldn't be able to just have booleans on the stack and use them as regular data. So how we would we make this? Well, we can sort of uh, use drop to do this. So if we have two elements and we want to choose the first one, then we can just remove the last one. And how will we delay execution? So we get something that can work as uh, data. Well, we just wrap it in a quotation. All right. If we apply this one, we get A. Same with false. This time we just have to swap stuff around before we drop it. All right, and then we get B. And then we just have to uh, encapsulate that in the quotation as well to get the delayed execution. So now I'm going to turn on some interesting stuff. Because next we're going to make not an and, and it's hard to reason about quotations with swap and drop in them. We'll just have, we'll write something, but it will be shown as false and true. All right, not is a very useful Boolean operator. Um, and how can we make it? The nice thing now is that Booleans are functions, and if you apply them, they'll choose one or the other thing. And we can exploit that in making not. So let's say that we have a Boolean, and we just place false and true in front of the Boolean, and then we apply it. Well, if it's true, it's going to choose the first a Boolean, and if it's false, it's going to choose the second Boolean. And if we place false as the first Boolean, then true is going to choose false and become false, and vice versa for false. We can see how this works. Well, let's start with true then. Okay, so this is the Boolean we want to not, and we can add false, and we can add true. And now we need to move the true value to uh, the front of false and true. So I know it says true here, but uh, this might not be the Boolean value we're trying to not. And we can do that with rotate. All right, so now we got the true on the top of the stack. And finally, if we apply it, we get false. And we can bind this into a named uh, function called not. We can do the same thing with and. Um, and is going to use um, uh, two Boolean values and going to organize them in another sequence. So we see that if we have a Boolean value x and y, and we just arrange them like y, x, x, and we applicate one of the x's, we magically get something that works like and. So how can we make something that constructs y, x, x? Well, let's just try to do this not with Booleans, but with symbols first. So let's say we have x and y, and we want to turn this into y, x, x. All right, we have to swap it, and then we have to duplicate the x. All right, we got y, x, x. And finally, we would have to applicate this. This will, of course, not work with symbols because application needs a quotation to work. We'll get some exception. Luckily, exceptions are just values on the stack, so we can remove them. OK, so let's try this with real Booleans. We have true, false, and then we need to swap it, and then we need to duplicate it, and finally apply it. OK, and true and false is false. I'm going to jump over the if-else example. It's exactly the same as um, not, but you just uh, grab some quotations instead and you apply them twice. Because then we can move over to numbers, the more uh, involved and uh, quite a bit interesting uh, church-encoded value. So what's the idea with numbers? Well, 
The idea with numbers is that you construct some function that accepts a function and a value, and then it applies that function to the value. And it creates a composition out of the function. So if you have uh, the value 2, for instance, you would apply uh, f, if that's the function, to the result of f of the value. So you sort of make a composition of one function, and the amount of times you compose that function is the same amount that you're trying to represent as a number. So given the number 2, you have the 2 composition of the function you send in. That's what you construct. Or given the number n, you would construct the n composition. So how would this look in a, a, a concatenative programming language? Well, let's look at the result columns first. So because that's where it's the nicest. We see that in the result column, we get just AFF because making a composition is very easy in a concatenative programming language. And making something that's tree would give us something that should work like you get AFFF and then you get a nice amount of uh, Fs depending on how large your number is. And then we can see, we can have a look at the expression that should create uh, this kind of result. Again, you would want something like booleans that work as a single element on the stack, so it's sort of more handy as data. That means you want to apply it. And then there's some minor difference between the functional expression and the concatenative expression. Here we have encapsulated the function that we want to make into a composition inside a quotation. And that's very handy because it makes uh, us able to put functions in the execution state without having it being evaluated immediately. All right, so what's a very naive solution for this? Well, we could just write the f, the amount of times that we want it. So let's say we have f, and then the quotation of f. Well, let's say we want to make tree. Well, we need a quotation because we want something that we can move around as a single element. We want to remove the f quotation, and then we just need, yeah, let's say, three f's. Oh, it works. Yay. <laughs> so. Um, and for zero, we can just remove the F quotation. So the nice thing about this naive solution is that it works for zero. We have made zero work in general. Yay, that's good. So what do we need to do in order to make something that's a bit more general? Well, we would like some kind of function that's able to lift or pick this F function out of the quotation and make a new quotation containing drop and the function. And we're going to try to make that. Uh, I call this function pick because it sort of picks the function out. And this is a bit more involved, um, but we can see how it goes. So we have A and F. And I'll start with putting our temporary representation of zero on the top there as well. Yeah, and at this point, I should probably turn off the magic. OK. So why did I put zero down there? Well, if you know church encoding, you'll see that this is probably a good idea. And if you don't know it, you'll probably experience it later in the talk. But how could I pick up the F now? Well, first, I need to grab the F quotation. So I need to swap stuff around. Then I probably want to duplicate the F quotation, because I don't want to sort of eat up the quotation uh, while I'm making the number. And then I need to put the F quotation back where it used to be. And I can do that with rotate. And then I just uh, want to organize the two topmost quotations so I'm ready to make drop and then F. And I can do that with swap. And finally, I can concatenate the two topmost quotations into one quotation. I do that with concat. All right. We can make this uh, sequence of statements into pick. So we, we try to do that again. We get pick, pick. All right, now we're getting somewhere. So we still have a problem, because um, now a number would be the drop quotation and then three picks if you want to make three. But that's not a single element on the stack. And at this point, we can go kind of two ways. Either we can just uh, contain everything we have taken bef uh, before into one quotation, just as we did with the booleans. But this gives something that's uh, a little bit interesting. So we have AF, and when we can do the drop quotation, and we do, let's see, 
two picks. What happens when we apply this? Well, we create a function that's going to work as a number, but it now has f put inside of it. So in order to applicate the number, we have to apply this another time as well. And I think this is interesting. It's not very useful, uh, but it sort of illustrates something a bit like partial application. Another way of doing this would be, of course, to include the application into our definition of the number. So if we have something like this, drop, and then let's say a couple of picks. Whoop. Now if we apply this, we'll get our result immediately. OK, we're pretty close now. We have something that works as a number, and it works the way we expect it when we apply it, and it's a single element, so we can move it like a single data element. But it's still quite hard, because we have to write each number as a new function. So if we want to write three, we have to write the drop quotation, pick, 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 and applicate. And what we would like is some function that's able to construct new numbers usually starting with zero and adding another number, so that we can make uh, some uh, uh, a specific number just by taking one number that's one less and adding one more. And we can do this with the successor function. And the idea with the successor function is that we need to sort of split the drop quotation off the top, and then, so let's see, just uh, split it off the top. And then we want to insert a pick, so we add a pick quotation. And then we needed to orga organize this so we have the drop quotation and the pick quotation and the app quotation. And we can do that with a rotation. And finally, we need to concat these things together to get our next number. So we concat twice. All right, this gives us a number, the number one, or two, or three. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I have a one bonus uh, thing to show you. So you can do church encoding. We could have made plus, we could have made multiply, we could make other stuff. But you can read all about that in the standard library. Uh, so instead, I'm going to show you how to make self-replicating code in stick. So let's say we have a quotation like this. It duplicates something, and then it applies it. So let's say we try to duplicate this quotation and then apply it. Oh, we get a stack overflow. <laughs> or a halting error, depending on the <laughs> what you prefer. All right, thanks for listening. <laughs> Yeah, I think I spent all my time, but if there's any questions? No, team not the Oh, I've been too quick. Whoa, <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, I can show you some bonus stuff then. Um, so I talked about how you can read about uh, making minus a multiplication in the standard library. Well, Stick has a sort of an interesting standard library. Um, because uh, stick files, so programming files, are defined in Markdown. So it just parses a Markdown file and it grabs all the code examples. And the code examples are the stick program. Uh, and this is nice because it exemplifies, uh, I think it's literate programming. The nice thing is that Markdown has two uh, different syntaxes for making code sections. The one is using the triple dots and the second one is moving stuff just inside and then you can inline code examples and stuff. But the, the part that becomes the stick program is only the one with the three dots. And that means that you can write both code and code examples inside the same Markdown document. Um, if you want to learn more about stick or use it, uh, it's available online. The talks are available online as well. You probably don't want to use talk stick though. You can use uh, try stick. This is sort of more geared towards uh, people just wanting to play with the language. Um, you can also download it and compile it locally, so you get the full performance experience of using Stick. It runs pretty fast to, to being a homemade uh, sort of functional thingy. Yeah, I think that's uh, everything I wanted to say. 
Any questions? Anyone thought about something? No? Okay. You can just talk to me later if you want.